Some good news is coming from Zimbabwe as the nation expects 350,000 tons harvest of wheat over a local consumption rate of 400,000 tons. Could this be the beginnings of a potential cash cow? And later in the show, confidence in Ghana's ability to pay back has been shaken with the latest Fitch downgrade to CCC. What would this lead to for the West African nation? This is Business Edge. I'm Tolu Lakwe, Adela Rubalogo. Let's start with the African business headlines. Since mid-June, crude oil prices have fallen by 22.5%, releasing pressure on local pump pricing as concerns about an oncoming global recession hold commodity markets and undermine demand projections. Oil prices have dropped to an average of $95 per barrel, a level last seen prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Diesel, gasoline and kerosene prices, which have been rising in recent months, and have contributed to inflation trading at multi-year highs of 8.3% should be relieved of some of the pressure as a result. The decrease would also occur at a time when Kenya has been ordered by the International Monetary Fund to end its fuel subsidy program by October, putting drivers at risk of a dramatic increase in gas costs. And within four months, Rwandans living abroad have deposited 926 million Kenyan shillings with the Bank of Kigali as new customers. Now, following a fruitful marketing campaign that saw 302 new diaspora banking accounts created, the cash deposits were gathered from both current and new clients. The diaspora banking campaign targeted Rwandans living abroad. Participants could win a round-trip ticket from anywhere in the world to Kigali, as well as a vacation package at a luxurious resort in Rwanda, all by depositing 114,000 shillings in either a new diaspora account or an existing diaspora account. Burundi is getting ready to open a window for the import of sugar and cement to fill a gap that has led to a black market where prices have skyrocketed. Following a meeting of the Council of Ministers in Getiga last week, the cabinet disclosed this in a statement. The cabinet said that there were differences between the reference prices and the market's actual prices and that attempts to impose official prices had been fruitless. Since 2021, state-owned producers have also been requesting a price review due to factors such as rising transportation and raw material prices with the two biggest examples being the beer maker Barudi and the cement producer Bisiko. The Egyptian National Railways has signed an agreement with Spanish train manufacturer Talgo to produce and supply seven luxurious sleeper trains, according to an official statement. Now, under the agreement, Talgo will conduct maintenance for the new trains for the next 15 years, including the supply of spare parts and relevant equipment. The new trains will feature 18 carriages each, and that's according to the Minister of Transportation, Kamal al-Waziri. And those are a few of our business headlines. We'll take a time out now. When we come back, we head to Zimbabwe for our very first conversation. A bumper harvest? Could it be a bumper cash cow after this? This year's winter crop is expected to yield 350,000 tons of wheat for Zimbabwe, and the anticipated output is exceeding around 180,000 tons of wheat harvested the previous year by 94%. The amount of wheat produced for Zimbabwe, which needs 400,000 tons of wheat annually, has decreased over time. To cover for the shortfall, Zimbabwe has been relying on imports to meet wheat demand. And Zimbabwe should have a record harvest, according to Orbert Jiri, the Chief Director of Agricultural Advisory Services, who was speaking to stakeholders at the Bupi Lapani Irrigation Project in the North Province. Now, Zimbabwe has over the years been over-reliant on wheat and flour imports amid subdued domestic production, which has exposed the economy to global shocks occasioned by supply chain disruptions linked to COVID-19, climate change dynamics, and now the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Zimbabwe imports the bulk of its wheat from Eastern Europe. Joining me now from Harare, Zimbabwe, is Prosper Chitabara, 
He's a development economist and policy advisor. Prosper, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So I know we're having some good news coming from Zimbabwe right now with this uh, announcement of the harvest. But let's look at the current state of things as it is. And I did mention the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis in my introduction. So let's look at that first of all in terms of how uh, that has impacted the local economy, bread prices, and all the things dependent on wheat imports um, into Zimbabwe. So what's been the impact for Zimbabweans with this particular crisis that we've been seeing unfold? I would say that it has uh, exacerbated a very dire situation uh, even prior to the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, the economy was already in uh, some challenges uh, with the uh, inflation actually increasing. So the crisis, uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is uh, exacerbated, for example, the inflationary pressures. Um, our inflation now almost 250 percent from about 192 percent uh, in, in June last in June this year to so about 257 uh, in, in July. Uh, we have also seen some supply side uh, bottlenecks. Uh, businesses have been affected. Capacity utilization is slightly weakened, and uh, our predictions for this year in terms of capacity utilization uh, in industry uh, are slightly uh, below what was initially uh, forecasted uh, by the 2022 national budget uh, was presented. So they had to rise uh, in the mid-term fiscal policy too, that was uh, announced about two weeks ago. So, and of course, the, the, because of chronic inflation, uh, the number of citizens that are living in extreme poverty is also increased. Okay, so that helps us to establish how things stand now. So uh, Zimbabwe typically consumes around 400,000 tons of wheat per year, and this is an estimated harvest of about 350,000 tons from a time when Zimbabwe didn't even produce up to this amount, and that's even just last year. This is an increase of about 94%. What's been the difference that has gotten Zimbabwe from just around 180-something thousand tons to this 350,000 tons for this harvest? And the, the, the number of factors. The first one, obviously, the fact that the wheat hectare is actually increased quite significantly from about 6,000 uh, hectares to about uh, 75,000. And we have also seen more land uh, under irrigation. We've actually been able to ensure uh, we increase our capacity for, for, for irrigation. Uh, so, and, and of course, we've also seen the, the role of the private sector actually increasing. Uh, in terms of uh, not just the, product, the direct production in terms of farmers, uh, but also even the financing uh, of, of, of the production has seen the private sector also increasing their participation in terms of financing of uh, wheat production. So I would say the combination of those three factors, the exchange, increase in irrigable land, and also greater involvement by the private sector uh, contributed to in fact, government is even more bullish. Government is projecting winter wheat production at around 383,000 metric tons. It's just short of the 1,000 uh, metric tons that, 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 that we fire for on, on an annual basis. So, Prosper, how much impact do you expect that this harvest, especially the internal harvest, is going to have for Zimbabwe? I think it will have a quite a significant uh, effect, positive effect, for, in terms of, for example, the price of uh, wheat and the price of bread. Uh, over the recent uh, weeks, we have seen an increase in the price of bread. So, with this improved, uh, improvement in supply and production of wheat, so that should actually help moderate uh, the increase in the price of bread. And also, it should also save the country a valuable foreign currency. Mm. Uh, which should also have a stabilizing effect in terms of uh, the exchange. All right, so Prosper, hold the line. We're going to go on a quick break now. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation. There are a number of issues around Zimbabwe's crops, of course, agriculture in the country. With this bumper harvest, it, as my guest has said, would also save the country some foreign exchange in terms of importing. But there's more to that. And then, of course, we'll touch on what remains quite a thorny issue uh, involving white farmers in Zimbabwe. 
Stay with us. My guest is Prosper Chitambara, development economist and policy advisor, as we look at Zimbabwe experiencing a bumper harvest for the winter harvest of wheat. And Zimbabwe is one of the countries that is unfortunately quite tied to wheat imports from the rest of the world, particularly eastern Ukraine, um, eastern Europe, I beg your pardon, and has been significantly affected and impacted by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So Prosper, right before we went for a break, I was asking you about whether you, or not you thought um, this harvest would have some impact. And you did mention that in terms of uh, helping the country to save on foreign reserves uh, or foreign exchange that would be needed to bring in the importation uh, of the wheat. But let me follow up with that. In terms of the prices right now, we've seen it across the continent. The prices of bread and flour have skyrocketed. How long do you think it might take for us to see the impact of this harvest on prices in Zimbabwe? Well, normally the harvesting begins around September, October, around October. Uh, so I would uh, think that probably they, we could begin to see a favorable effect in terms of pricing around the time of the harvest, around, of, I think from, I would say from October uh, going forward, I think we should begin to see an effect in terms of, uh, of the pricing of bread and pricing of flour, among others. So you listed a number of factors that are responsible for this increase, again, to emphasize a 94% increase from last year's harvest. Uh, but a lot of people would also focus on government. Government has a lot to do in possibly subsidizing farmers or subsidizing the agricultural uh, sector of any country for food security. So in terms of maintaining this sort of streak in the harvest and even surpassing it, what do you think needs to be done? Yeah, no, I think obviously government still has to continue uh, with the initiatives that, that, that have been implemented in the past in terms of uh, ensuring greater support uh, to our farmers. Uh, of course, government has uh, unveiled the National Enhanced Agricultural Productivity Scheme, uh, as well as the traditional presidential input scheme. So I, I would say in view of the chronic inflationary trends, obviously there is need to upscale uh, those subsidies or those uh, support initiatives by government. But of course, over and above that, I think we need to see the private sector playing a greater role, especially the, the, the private development finance, uh, the banking sector, uh, in terms of financing uh, of agriculture uh, in general. Uh, because government, my view is that government has borne a disproportionate grant in terms of financing of agriculture in general. And obviously that has also had a destabilizing effect uh, because of the massive increase in liquidity and money supply growth uh, that we have seen, especially on account of uh, the presidential input scheme as uh, subsidy programs. So we can't ignore the fact that Zimbabwe is still facing sanctions, sanctions that emanated from some decisions involving uh, land and agriculture many, many years ago. So let's talk about those sanctions. Regardless of what input you might get from government or even the private sector, how do you think the sanctions continue to impact Zimbabwe's agricultural sector? And of course, issues around whether it's to simply um, produce up to the needs of the local population or even to be an exporter for others around the region and the continent. I think one of the biggest channels has been the it's been difficult for our local financial institutions uh, to be able to get, for example, lines of credit, especially from uh, Western uh, banks, uh, Western financial institutions. So, and even if we do are able to to, to get that, uh, the interest rates are, are are way high, higher than the the, the normal interest rates uh, that any other normal economy would probably uh, get. So, in terms of access to financing, whether it's global finance, um, it's really been difficult and it's been very, very expensive if, if we're actually able to get that because of the high uh, country risk factor or the high political risk premium uh, that's uh, attached to uh, doing business in Zimbabwe uh, on account of a number of factors, including uh, ob ob obviously the sanctions. Mm. So but is there, I think so over and above that also the issues of uh, security of tenure around uh, the title of land, I think it, it also needs to be uh, finalized, uh, ensuring that these farmers get title deeds. I think that's also important 
in terms of ensuring that at least the local financial sector is able to provide more finance uh, to our farmers. But of course, the central bank has increased, has yet to increase the bank policy rate from about 80% to the current 200%. So obviously, that also affects uh, the cost of accessing uh, finance from the local uh, financial institutions by, by the farmers. Okay. So I, I want to stay on the sanctions very quickly and then we'll move on to something else. But in terms of the sanctions, Zimbabwe has asked for a number of years now that the sanctions be removed. There are conditions on those sanctions which involves the return of land to white farmers or at least some form of compensation. So is there an update? Um, there have been legal documents. Zimbabwe should have paid some of these white farmers the compensation for their land. What's the, what's the current standing of that situation as it is right now? Because it's a massive situation that, effect, that affects Zimbabwe's ability to go to the international market, to export. It's one of the reasons we see inflation is so high and that the currency is also suffering drastically as well. So where do we stand on that right now? I, I think I missed a, an earlier part of your question. But uh, what, what the government obviously has signed a global, what's called a global a compensation deed uh, with the former white farmers uh, to, to compensate uh, the former white farmers for the improvements uh, on the land. But of course, the biggest problem has been getting the finances to actually compensate the farmers. Uh, I, I know uh, some token payments uh, have been made but very very insignificant and uh, the minister of finance actually announced that uh, that, that in the uh, recently announced mid-term budget uh, that some some payments have been, been, been made but again the bill is uh, around two three point five billion us dollars so um, that, that that's huge and uh, government's degrees of freedom in terms of mobilization of that uh, are, are really limited, uh, of course, also because of sanctions. All right, before I let you go, Prosper, so we've looked at the issue around sanctions. We know that the harvest is coming just 50,000 tons under uh, the country's uh, annual consumption. So do you think we can expect to see this kind of harvest continue like this, and also potential for Zimbabwe to possibly export to the neighboring region. The country is a member of the SADC region as well, so possibly looking at other African countries that have been hit hard by the shortfall because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, and look at the potential to become a breadbasket once again for the continent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I think that there is great potential, and we've seen government has been investing in roads, sorry, in dams, and of course in roads again, which are enablers. And uh, we've seen an increase uh, in the total uh, acreage uh, of land under irrigation. Of course, currently we are still at about 15% of uh, potentially irrigable land, uh, which is actually under irrigation. But uh, government is actually projecting that we could actually increase those numbers uh, within uh, in, in the foreseeable future. So I think there's potential uh, that probably in the next uh, one or even two to three years, we should actually be able to be a net wheat exporter instead of being a net wheat importer. All right, so we'll leave it at that. Prosper Chitambara, thank you so much. Development economist and policy advisor who joined me from Harare, Zimbabwe. We'll be talking to you again soon. Thank you for having me. And I know that many of us could use some good news coming from Zimbabwe. And that is really some great news. A lot of African nations have had to sit up and take cognizance of the dependence we have on imports from the West, particularly with the Russia-Ukraine crisis, showing that food security on the continent is one thing we still have not gotten right. But if Zimbabwe can go in the next two to three years to being a net exporter of wheat, that's one way we could start handling the situation. There's much more coming for you on the show. Up next, we have international business news. And then after that, we get into what's happening with one of the largest economies in West Africa. We'll be heading to Ghana after this.